Well, so England go through uh, to face uh, the Belgians uh, in Bologna, and we have to leave the hellhole that uh, Sardinia had been and uh, head, head for the mainland. And I think by now, people were really were starting to take notice and to think um, England, perhaps not the worst team around in the tournament. It was some straight knockout football now, which we were good at. We did have a, have a habit of, of gradually improving. The formation was settled. Brian Robson, sadly, was no longer, was no longer part of it, but uh, they'd managed to compensate for Brian's injuries. And uh, things were starting to look pretty optimistic, if I'm honest. And I, and I even think that perhaps the, the, because the publicity back home was, was, was being generated and was, was improving, and people were saying nice things, that the media versus players thing, that had abated a bit as well. When England played uh, Belgium and the game went into extra time, I was down at pitch side waiting to do the post-match interview and it, the goal was a heck of a long time coming. Again, Gaza was very much instrumental in it. I think he won the free kick and took the free kick uh, as well. And it was a goal that transformed David Platt's career. It, uh, he, he had uh, big money moves after that and I think that goal did him no harm at all. And all of a sudden, David Platt, who'd been, a, if I'm honest with you, a bit of a bread and butter player really, really with England, um, all of a sudden he, he was in the headlines the next day because of that absolutely spectacular winner. One of the great... World Cup moments from England's point of view and to do it then, 119 minutes on the clock. Thank you very much indeed, David Platt. These days, England have a phobia about penalties. That wasn't around in 1990 because England had never been involved in a penalty shootout. So uh, the demons weren't there, the skeletons weren't rattling in the cover. But I guess, realistically, there's a minute on the clock. They've been playing for nearly two hours and, and it's, it's still nil-nil you've got to have a penalty shootout on your mind. So next stop, Cameroon in Naples. Now, Cameroon had uh, blazed a new trail for African countries. They had a, a wonderful individual in a 38-year-old called Roger Miller, who'd got to four goals in the tournament, and had one of the great celebs of all time. I remember John Helm, the commentator, calling him the greatest swinger in town when he did the celebration around, around the corner flag in the corner. They were big, they were strong, they were athletic, um, but of course, the old English arrogance came through, oh, we'll beat them easy, we'll beat them easy. Now, I know Bobby Robson had had scouts watching them, and I know that a couple of things have been pinpointed about the Cameroons, how strong, how athletic, and how well-drilled they were, but also, very importantly, how they did tend to tire towards the end of games, and their discipline was very, very poor, particularly when they were defending just outside the penalty area. That came through in a report to Bobby Robson, I know that and lo, it came to pass, but what a struggle England had to get by Cameroon. Bobby was concerned about Cameroon, definitely, and he's, as a football man, he would know that at that stage of any tournament, you're not gonna get an easy touch. You're not gonna get an easy touch at all. And I think enough of the, of the, of the wise judges who had reported to him made, made him realize that Cameroon were dangerous, and they proved to be that on the night. They were very dangerous, and uh, England had to, had to come back had to come back to, to get through and qualify for the semi-final. The players were very relieved to have got through that. Fair play to, to Gary Lineker. I think I, I described him as ice in the veins for the way he, he, he took those penalties as well. Abs absolutely outstanding. Uh, the Cameroon in discipline had been exploited. But um, this in England were one step now from reaching the World Cup final. There was proper relation and Gascoigne, I remember, was at, at the middle of everything as he was, bubbling, bubbling as ever. And so was Bobby too. There, there was genuine relation and now the belief was there. I mean, it's, we had started slowly, we'd improved, but now people were genuinely believing that England would repeat what they did in 1966 and become champions of the world in 1990. Well, Gaza cake involved a fracas with myself and a very gentlemanly BBC reporter called Rob Bonnet. Two people that you probably wouldn't envisage being involved in a poolside brawl. And I have to hold my hand up, it was down to me, in that I, it had been a long tournament. I got Gaza's birthday wrong. And I thought it was on that particular day in June, it actually was in May. 
So I said, boys, let's get Gazza a birthday cake and we'll do it, we'll give it to him poolside. I know he'll be at poolside with Waddle, etc., etc., and we'll give him the, this lovely big chocolate cake. I, in hindsight, I should have known better in so many areas of this that it's not true that a cake near Gascoigne and a pool is a lethal combination. Anyway, we come over with a cake and we have the camera crew around and give it to Gascoigne and the BBC crew that's nearby. All of a sudden they come over and they want a slice of the cake as well, don't they? And that's where the pushing and shoving started. It all ended up horribly. Cake all over Gasco and a big lump of it over Waddle as well. And myself and Rob Bonnet scuffling rather unseemly. And Bobby Robson summed it all up when he said, um, well, I've known all about hooligan fans. Goodness me, we got two hooligans here from BBC and ITV. Um, at the Stadio del Alpi for, for that semi-final, uh, England against West Germany, I was pitch side uh, watching the game very close to the England benches again. And the goal that went in was a horror, really. I and mean, it was a massive, great deflection off, um, uh, off Paul Parker from Andreas Bremer and Peter Shilton, who'd been outstanding in the England goal. It was one of those, as soon as you saw it go up in the air and come on, that you knew that Paul Shilts wasn't going to get that. And it was a horrible way to concede a goal. So once again, England had to battle back, and indeed we did. Get into very edgy territory late in that game. It looked as though the World Cup adventure was going to end. The Germans had better preparation, a bit of extra time than England, and it was starting to look as though we weren't going to make it. And then up popped Gary, gave us all hope. It was an equaliser, and that spelt extra time. I think the great thing about that night, everybody, of course, inevitably remembers the horrible uh, missed penalties uh, that happened in the shootout. Before that, England had done themselves proud. Bobby Robson had done, has done himself proud. They had gone out on that stage and delivered. There'd been no, no parking the bus. There'd been no negative football. England had taken the Germans on, looked them in the eye and had played really, really well. When Paul Gascoigne saw Claudio Canigia get a second yellow card in the first semi-final, Italy against Argentina, that ruled this wonderful player Canigia out of the final, it was obviously on his mind because he said to me, I was sitting right next to him, he said, Jim, I can't let that happen to me. So he knew perhaps he was walking a tightrope. So then came the horrible moment when Gaza made this rash challenge and he knew it and he, he knew what he had done. And it was almost like, what have I done here as well? It was just one of those instinctive things that had happened. You knew the card was coming. You knew the bottom lip was gonna go and you just hoped, and indeed he did, that Gaza would, would keep his mind on the job. Um, and I think that was one of the moments that actually got millions of people involved and interested in football again. Italia 90 was just a big turning point when, when it almost the, the general public fell in love with football. And I think Gaza, at that moment, the look on his face, and he knew he wouldn't be able to rep represent his country. I think that was a big factor in it. I think people really warmed to him there, um, even though it was a horrible, horrible moment in his football career. I was probably 20 yards away from that. I think the, the, other, the other side of the running track there. Um, and it was... It was it, the fact that I was there, or I was I was closer to it, did, didn't didn't really affect things too much. We all you watch most a lot of it on monitors anyway to see what see what is happening. But um, yeah, I was close enough to see it in my role as a an ITV reporter to feel his pain as well. So we come to virgin territory penalty shootout, and the first three are exemplary, and. I can remember there's a lovely story that Peter Beardsley told me when he's preparing to take his penalty and Bobby came over to him and said, um, whatever you do, don't miss. There are 25 million people watching at home. And Peter Beardsley said he was chuckling about that all the way down to taking it. And whether that was reverse psychology, goodness knows, but it's a heck of a thing to have blown in your ear before you take a penalty. Um, first three all go fine. And then, it all goes wrong uh, with, with Messrs Pierce and, and Waddle. And um, it, it just underlines to me, it's happened many times since, what a lottery a shootout is. And that these days, managers actually shake hands before 
the penalties because they know, don't they? They know that, that someone's going to miss and someone's going to be a fall guy. It's a horrible way to go out of the tournament. Absolutely horrible. And um, interestingly, the way things were then because of extra time, there was no call for after match interviews. We were off the air. And I can remember actually hightailing it back away from Turin um, to find there was an alcohol exclusion around the ground. I think it was 50 miles or something like that. And so we hightailed it back and found a, and found a bar somewhere outside that exclusion zone to drown our sorrows and to drown England's sorrows as well. Horrible, just a horrible way to go out. For me, Italian 90 was the springboard to a total change in the game of football. Certainly uh, business-wise, where we are now with football, it's gone beyond anyone's, anyone's imagination. I think Italian 90 made a whole swathe of people fall in love with the game and attracted a massive new following as well. Um, Pavarotti had a little bit to do with it. I think as soon as those tunes came on and inspired choice of the BBC, by the way, I think about 15 people claimed that particular idea. But uh, it was just the romance around that World Cup. Actually, the romance around it didn't, didn't, didn't really match up to what was happening. I think it was one of the lowest scoring World Cups in history. Italia 90, though, really... The game changed after that. The Premier League came in, riches came in, the families came back to football. Players went into a, a financial stratosphere, the, the, the peak players, that, um, that really, that they should probably look back and say, Italia 90, thank you very much indeed, because that's where it all started. That's where, where the, and now football is so much part of the fabric of society. Let me tell you, a few years before 1990, if you said you were a football fan, people crossed the street, they didn't want to know. And I think Italia 90 just changed people's perception of football, of the great game, of the romance of it, of the drama of it as well, of the heroes and villains. And a couple of years later, the Premier League started. Look where we are now. Football is now a worldwide phenomenon. Wasn't then, is now, Catalyst Italia 90.